Hallelujah. We'll be looking at uh, another thing that I think God also answers because God has so many answers. God has answer also for resentment. They called him Daddy King. When Martin Luther King Sr. died in 1984, one black leader said this, if we started our own country, he would be our George Washington. In his 84 years, he endured more than his share of suffering. It is recorded that Martin Luther King Sr. wanted to register for voting. And he discovered that the office was on the second floor of the city hall. That the lift to second floor that was functioning was written whites only. The stairs to go to the second floor was blocked. The other lift that was there for blacks was not functioning. So as a child, he grew up knowing hatred, knowing violence, knowing uh, people being lynched. That's what Martin Luther King Sr. knew. However, Martin Luther King Sr. is only remembered for the accomplishment of his son, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the leader of the nonviolent civil rights movement, who was killed by an assassin bullet in 1968. But that was not the end of the struggles and the pain of Martin Luther King Sr. Because in 1974, while his wife was leading people in prayer and she was leading people in the Lord's Prayer, a young man woke up from the church and started shooting everyone, and she fell down on a hail of bullets while Martin Luther Sr. was on the pulpit. Near the end of his life, he spoke about the policy of nonviolence that he had come to embrace. There is a quote that I want to quote from him. He says, there are two men that I really hate. One is a white man, the other is a black man. Both of them are suffering life sentence for committing murder. I don't hate either one. There is no time for that and no reason either. Nothing that a man does takes him lower than what he allows himself to fall so low as to hate anyone. But how can a man like Martin Luther Sr. not hate people who have taken away his wife and the life of his oldest son who were murdered by bullets? The answer comes back to that statement that he said, there is no time for that. There is no time for that. To hate is to live in the past. To hate is to dwell on the deeds already done. Anytime you think about hating someone, it is because of something that was done. It is not something that is, not, is being done now. Therefore, hatred is the most damaging emotion. For it gives the person you hate a double victory. Victory in the past and victory in the present. Because they still control you. No time to hate is a word. No time to hate, not then, not now, will be something for us to know. Therefore, we have to learn on how to forgive. God has an answer for my resentment. And the answer for my resentment is forgiveness. Forgiving does not mean whitewashing the past, but does mean refusing to live there. You see... 
Many times people do us wrong and you know I'm speaking to myself as I speak to you. Because there is a possibility that you remember what a person did for you many years ago. And that's why we go to the encounter to try and help you uh, forgive these people. Because they have entrenched themselves in us and unless we pull them out and look them at the face and tell them, I have forgiven you, you will always be a slave of those people that you hate. So therefore, to hate is to live in the past. To hate is to dwell with the things that are already done. Forgiving is costly. Let me tell you, forgiving is costly. I have a friend of mine who has gone to be with the Lord because he was a friend but old. He passed on a couple of years. But I used to visit him uh, by, by chance. You know, chance. I, I used to look forward to escort one of his daughters home because we were ministering together. And every time I would visit, of course, young people, you know when we visit, we don't go until we eat. And uh, we, we, we would talk. So one day, in our many conversation, one day we sat down and as we were eating, we were just the two of us. The, you know, you know in, a, in, a, in a Kikuyu custom or African custom, uh, ladies do well as they prepare tea and food, and so they do very well. But I normally tell Alice, take care. You might prepare tea, and we are selling you a house. So you need to be around, so that whatever happens, of course, we have a house here. So this man, by the name of Stanley, Stanley gave me this testimony of how he came to know about the Lord Jesus Christ. He had gone to school and he was, they were walking from Banana Hill in a place called Mobatha because there is a lake there that is artificial when it rains. I don't know whether now it is not there, but there is a place called Mombasa because of the lake. He used to walk all the way from that place to Kabete, Lower Kabete, the mother church. That's where the school was. And uh, one day he got saved. And when he got saved, the preacher who preached says, salvation is one thing, but you need to be reinstated, and to be reinstated, you need to deal with your past and pay the cost. He had run away from Kiambu, because those are days where people are fighting for independence. He was arrested in Kiambu prison. And one day he had a chance to run away and he did. When they had gone to Kulimia Mboga Mboga Uko, he disappeared. And then now he has gotten saved. Now he has to go back and do restitution. He has to, do, to restore everything. So he walked back and went to Kiambu to a Muzungu. And he told him, I'm coming to repent because I had run away. The Muzungu was so happy, he took him back. We've been looking for you. But this is what he told me. This time when he was in there, he was so happy because he was not there because he had done something wrong. He was there because he had gone to us for forgiveness. So he was telling me, Kimani, you have to know this. Unless you deal with your past, it will attack you when you are old. Deal with it. Forgive, don't, don't allow the past to keep on harassing you. He's the same man that used to tell me, Kimani, don't jump up only. Hold the ground. Know where you are coming down. Otherwise, vijana wegida munaruka mkurudi munaanguka. So jump na unajua mahali utaland. And I used to, to visit there are many, many times so that we can have this conversation with Stanley. And Stanley later, he, he became uh, an evangelist and he, he used to go from village to village to share 
the word of the Lord. Martin Luther uh, Sr. or Daddy had a reason to hate, but he chose not to hate. He said there are two people that he really hates, or he could hate, or he can hate. One is a Muzungu, other one is a black man, but both of them are condemned for murder. He has no reason to hate them. Ephesians 4, verse 29 to 32. Ephesians 4, 29 to 32. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. With all malice. Can we do it with King James? Let's try King James. Is that King James? Did we read it with the King James or New King James? Now that is King James. Let not corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of identifying that it may. Hallelujah. It may give grace to the hearers. Minister grace to the hearers. Verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed unto the day of redemption. Verse 31. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And verse number 32. And be ye kind one to another, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven us. Ephesians 4, 29 offers a Christian alternative. First, we are to speak words that build instead of tearing down. Secondly, we are to speak words that minister grace to those who hear them. And here is the teaching of this verse. If you forget everything that I want to say, if you want an answer to your situation where you are carrying people over the years, is this. Every word you speak, it has to be all good. It has to carry all grace. And it has to do it all the time. So that every word that you speak, it has to be good. It has to carry grace. And it has to be all the time. And you know, sometimes we need somebody who can tell us the whole truth. Yesterday, I think we were somewhere. Was it yesterday or the day before yesterday? And we were talking about someone. And uh, yeah, we were having something at Java and we were talking about someone who, whose mouth has no grace. Have you ever met someone whose mouth has no grace? Whatever comes out, either he's enjoying someone or belittling someone. So there, there is this man, this pastor, a young pastor, who uh, had gone to minister somewhere and he met another pastor, an older pastor. But as they talk, he started belittling another pastor who they knew, both of them. The way we can meet and we start talking about uh, medicine or talk about Mwashi with Kibera. And uh, at that time, Nikukatakata, Tutukatakata, whoever we are talking about, Nikukatakata. Then this senior pastor, when he heard what he said, he said, No, hold on. You cannot say that as a believer, as a Christian, over another believer, another Christian. You cannot. You ought not to. And yet, 
It's so easy for us. Actually, it's so easy to discuss everyone. It's so easy to discuss the pastor. It's so easy to discuss the bishop. It's so easy. And sometimes whatever we say, we, it's like we are afraid, so we keep on supporting what others are saying. If they are saying the bishop is good, we also say it's good. And then another day, the bishop is not good, so the bishop is not good. People have that. And we will build resentment in us. But this pastor, when he was told that, he felt it was like a knife that plunged into him. And he has always remembered that. Every time he wants to be critical, he wants to, be, uh, to make a critical comment to either about his family, about a friend, or a colleague, or someone he has even met casually. That helps. And you know, we need those kind of friends. Friends that will tell us, don't say that about the servant of the Lord. Ridiculous. You remember ridiculous? Ridiculous is to play with everybody, including preachers. But there is one preacher in this country who said, let them dare. She dared them. They could not. She just dared them. She dared them. And you know, you and I would watch and be so happy when they are ridiculousing even the preachers. May God help us. You and me, we need to be helped. We need people who can tell us, Zima hiyo television, atuoni hiyo. We are not going to sit around and watch ridiculous. Humiliate our leaders. Talk ill about the ministers. Imitate preachers. Because one preacher told them, I dare you. And they wouldn't do anything. But you see, friends, brothers and sisters, we have so many excuses on what we say. If you say it, we have many excuses. For example, we might say this. We, we were tired when we said it. Or we were provoked when we said it. Or we weren't thinking when we said it. Or we did not mean it when we said it. Or we might say it was true. That's why we said it. Who made it true? It's yourself. But the Bible is trying to encourage us that we need to get to a place where we are not only talking about what God is telling us to do, but we are so eager to, ed to edify the people. Use of edifying that may minister grace unto the hearers. What the NIV translates as unho unwholesome talk, the King James calls it corrupt communication. The underlying word there, the Greek underlying word there means rotten. Rotten. And it was used for fish that was rotten. Or meat that was rotten and decaying. And in other words, that word is used, don't, don't use rotten words. Don't use rotten. Don't let any, any, any rotten words come out of your mouth. And, or you could say this. No trash talk. Let's not talk about trash. Let's talk about things that can give life. What qualifies as rotten speech? And here are a few examples. Vulgar language. Obscenity language. Indecent language. Ratio or ethnic insult or tribal insult. Abrasive humor, harsh words, mean-spirited comments, gossip, rumors, false accusation, public criticism of your spouse or children. You know, huyu ni mke wangu lakini you know, huyu ni mtoto wangu lakini Yelling and screaming. Hey, sauti, weka sauti kidogo chini buwana. You are talking to me and I can hear. Excuse me. Exaggerating the faults of others. You know, there are some of us that only wait for your mistake. Even like a small one. A sentence, a word, 
and their upper terms. And you know, sometimes, I, like, I don't know whether it is as age catches up with me. One thing that I can tell you for sure is that I forget. And it is not deliberate. I just, sometimes, I forget. On Wednesday, I met a friend we met at Java. No, at, on Wednesday in the morning, in our prayer, Alice had me pray for various things that I was going to do that day. The things that I was going to do were many. One, I was going to that meeting with that person. Two, I was going to another meeting in church. Three, I was going to another meeting in Iruiru. Four, I was going back home and rest. After breakfast, I call a friend of mine and he tells me, your friend's wife will be buried tomorrow, Thursday. And I knew Thursday I will not be available. So, what did I do? Ran to Kiambu so that I can mourn with another bishop friend of mine. And I had forgotten everything else. I had a meeting here at the three. I had another one, uh, you know, even where I was going to, to preach at Ruiru. I forgot all that. Here I am comforting the people of God. Then I see a phone and I ignore, I put it aside. Then we sat there until a few minutes to three. When, when I was leaving, I start calling. The first call I called was that brother who had called me. And he tells me, I am in church. I confessed immediately. I had forgotten. When were you to come? At three, I'm coming. Then when I got to Windsor, this other friend of mine, another bishop who wanted me to go and minister in his church, called me and he said, you can come just a little before five. And then I'm wondering, Wapi? Where? And then he tells me, the memorial service will not start until five. Bishop had forgotten. So I ran here first to pray with that pastor, stay with him for about an hour and so on. And thank you, Bertha, for taking care of my friend. He, he thought we had planned. So I come and we, we pray and, and with him and then I released him, and then 4.30, I'm on my way trying to get to Ruiru, and so on. Of course, I did not tell the members there that I had forgotten. Otherwise, they would think, So, this, this is it. Some, some of the things that would happen is that you have no idea. Now, if you have a spouse that waits for you to forget so that they can come on you at a certain age, then it can be humana. Because you'll be forgetting many, many times. Unachukua simu? Nilikuwa nipigie nani? Ama ujafanya hivyo? Unachukua simu, unaona ka message kengine, ka WhatsApp. Unapelekana nako, unasahau. Who, I, who am I going to call? It happens. So you need someone who can forgive you many times. Many, many times. Why is this important what we are talking about? Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life and death. So it is important for you to watch out what is coming out of your mouth. Every time you open your mouth, listen. It's either life or death. So maybe before you open. I know we... we you know the other problem, Moses, that we have? When I ask you something, I want you to answer like you are waiting for what I was going to ask, like you knew what I was going to ask. Is it possible? So when someone is posing a little bit, you're asking them, Umesikia vile nimekuambia? Nilisikia, lakini buwana. You know when we were young, you would answer anything and munaanza vita, siyo? But as, as you mature up, David, you start wondering, Death or life? Which one should come out? That's what 
Paul is trying to tell the, the Ephesians church. And it is because he's quoting from Proverbs 18.21, it is important for us to watch out because the power of life and death is in our mouth. So every time you open your mouth, either life or death comes out. The Bible speaks of this in the book of Romans. The throat has an open grave. When there is death in the inside, it will eventually show up in your words. If there is something dead in the inside, it will go through your throat and it will be seen. So every time you speak, remember, is it the life or death that is coming out? We can justify those things. We can say, no, I, 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 my, my, it was a slip of the tongue or I was this, I was the other. And we can justify all those words that we have spoken. But our excuses don't excuse us at all. What is God saying to us? No more speech that is rotten. Why is this important? Because Paul says in, in verse 30 of Ephesians 4, there is a sad consequences or consequence of our unkind words. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. Did you know you can grieve the Holy Spirit who lives within you? And you need to know you can only grieve a close friend or a loved one. You cannot grieve a stranger. Ati nimetoka hivi stranger na pita anakuwa grieved. No way. Anaweza kasirika mtu kukutana nae. You cannot grieve them. You can irritate a stranger. You can irritate somebody else. You can offend a casual acquaintance. But you can only grieve someone close to you. So Paul's advice is both practical and profound. You can grieve the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of God that lives within you. The Spirit which has sealed you for the day of redemption. May God help us. We tend to talk a lot about interpersonal problems as if the greatest issue in life is how we relate to other people. But verse 30 reminds us that our primary relationship is, is with God. You can make the Spirit of God weep because of your thoughtless words. You need to think. Evil speech destroys Christian unity. The Holy Spirit not only lives in you, he also lives in the Christian brother and sister you are talking about or you have just landed. He is there. So evil speech destroys Christian unity. It is important for you and I to know that whatever we say can either bring life or bring death. In Proverbs 27 verse 6 says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend. When a friend talks to you and rebukes you and counsels you or tells you to stop what you're doing, it, it might be sharp, but it will be very, very, very helpful for you. But as you do it to your brother, remove the pole in your eye before you remove the sawdust in your friend's, uh, friend's hands. We grieve the spirit first by rotten speech and second by evil attitudes. So we, when we have a rotten speech, verse 29, we, 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 we can grieve the spirit. But also in verse 31, when we have evil attitudes, but these two are not separate. They are out of the abundance of the heart. The mouth speaks. And whatever is in the heart must eventually come out. So it is both what I say and my attitude in it. Verse that one says this. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Because these wrong attitudes, they erode the soul from the inside out. 
Corrosion starts with bitterness. Bitterness. It is a word meaning pointed or sharp. Referring to the pain we feel when someone mistreats us. Bitterness. It speaks of a deep emotional reaction that keeps us from thinking clearly. If we deal in bitterness long enough, it will produce wounded spirit. And my prayer is that none of us will get to wounded spirit. Bitterness leads to wrath. This word originally meant to snort. It has the idea of someone that speaks something and it is like smoke is coming from the ears and the noses. Yani huyu When they speak, it is like, you know, whatever comes out of the nose and everywhere else. And this is what Paul is trying to tell us. Let bitterness and rather than anger be taken away. So let all bitterness, anger be taken away from us. Anger, bitterness, anger be taken away from us and wrath. The third word is anger. You know some people Wake up angry. They take breakfast annoyed and they're angry. They go to work, they are angry. They come home, they are angry. They eat dinner, they are angry. They are watching TV, they are angry. They sleep, they are angry. Those people are dangerous because you cannot please them. You cannot help them. Anger has taken the best part of them. Anger, everything, everything. Akiangalia TV in memkasirisha. Nae... Na unajua TV, hebu ni kuambia siri. TV kwa kasirisha, unakubali kukatirisha kanini? Hai. Jamaa ingia kwa nyumba yangu wa ni kasirishia na ni TV ni mimi menunua. Apana. Actually, I would do like uh, Alice's grandfather. Alice's grandfather was a chief. And the red you said Kenyatta has been arrested. And that's the end of Kenyatta. Then after a few years, he said Kenyatta has been released. He looked at that radio that said, where? <laughs> they, they normally say what is, he told that radio. Where? I mean, I mean, it's not possible. So, innocent radio. I refuse to be annoyed by that. I refuse to be annoyed at a breakfast. Why take it if it is annoying you? Leave it. You have a chance. In actual fact, what, what Paul is trying to tell the Ephesians, you have the power. Uvae nguo, alafu wanda uki apologize. Unajua higwe agwa, higwe agi mzuri sana. Why wear it? Ati iki hatu zijui nirinunua mutumba. Who wants to know whether it was a mutumba or not? That's what Paul is trying to say. This guy to please him is difficult. Angry people usually express themselves in clamor. And this is the fourth word where we have read. And this simply means shouting and screaming. Mtu kama mekasirika anaongeaga hata paka akiogea nayo ataipigia kerere. Na kuku ataipigia kerere. May God have mercy. Let me say this. The fifth word is slander. Slander. It, makes, it means to make false accusation against someone or attack them through vague insinuation. We can slander with words. We can slander with a lifted eyebrow. Unajua macho tu na una ama face tu. You can do that. You can also slander someone by unfinished sentence. Or by quoting others, or by taking words and twisting them so that they become sinister. May God help us. And slander was one of the sins of those who crucified Jesus. They mocked him and lied about him and falsely accused him and slandered him. So, someone who slanders 
If you slander, you are joining those who crucified our Lord. And finally, malice. The final word that Paul is warning us describes an underlying attitude of ill will. We could call it hatred, which is hidden. You know, a feature. A malicious person can't get along with anyone. What starts in the heart ends up in the lips. We think, we feel, then we speak. What starts as grievances becomes an outburst of wrath. And what that outburst does, it hardens and becomes anger that leads into clamor and slander. So malice Mark such a person through and through. Stop it early if you can. Guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. Guard it. The Bible is telling us, get, get rid of these things. Get rid of these attitudes, because these are attitudes. Get rid of them. The root of bitterness, the symptoms of wrath, the trace of anger, the echo of clamor, the slime of slander, the dregs of malice. When you harbor these things, the Holy Spirit whips inside us. What is the cure then? Oh, I like this. I told you God has an answer for us. He wants us to forgive. Verse 32. Be kind and compassionate to one another. Forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. If you are writing, write this. Kindness speaks of gentleness in the face of provocation. Kindness speaks of gentleness in the face of provocation. In other words, what kindness does, it reaches out to the unworthy and we behold punishment even when it is deserved. It is the oil that lubricates the machinery of life. Kindness. Kindness. It, gentleness in the face of you have been provoked, but you are kind. This person deserves something, but you have forgiven them. They deserve punishment, but you are not. You are kind. That becomes the oil that will lubricate the machinery of life. How about compassion? Compassion simply says this. I will care for you. I will not shut you out. I will care for you. So in other words, Paul is telling the Ephesians, be kind, speak gentle. Don't allow face of provocation. Don't allow to be provoked. That's what it's saying. And number two, he's saying have compassion with another. Don't shut anybody out. Every one of us deserves a chance. So forgiveness starts with God, comes down to us, then goes out to other people. Now, I hope you got it. Forgiveness starts with God who forgives us, and then forgiveness comes to us because of his forgiveness, and then it leaves us to other people. We forgive as God has forgiven us, we are to extend grace to others as God has extended grace to us. The undeserving, because we were undeserving, have been showered us with God's grace in Christ, then he gives us that grace also so that we can give it to those undeserving, the sinners that have sinned against us, if you like. Because we were sinners and God forgave us, then we can forgive those sinners that sin against us. From God to us to others. Grace to us, grace to others. We do for others what God has done for us. And we can remember what God has done for us. What has God done for us? God has removed our sins as far as east is from the west. God has put our sins behind his back. God has thrown them into the deep ocean. God remembers our sins no more. God has blotted our sins out. 
God has cancelled the debt that we owed. God has declared, Kemani, you're not guilty. And that's what God wants you to do for the others. You are supposed to do the same. God has given you that grace. Release the same grace to others. We, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, that's what we have received. We do the same. We forgive others freely, instantly, and totally. I know it is hard, but we need to do it. For some of us that were born and were adults in the 70s, there is a magazine that we used to read which came from Romania. It was the voice of the martyrs. And it was written, it was written by someone called Richard Wombrand. Richard tells a story in the voice of the matters in that magazine, but he is giving it in 1998. That's when he's doing it, just before he went to be with the Lord. And this is what he says. He gives a story of a man called Dimitri. He was in a prison in Romania. He was beaten with a hammer, paralyzing him, making him quadriplegic. Yani, ame pigwa kira maria. Ame umi. Akuna mugu inaenda na igine ata mikono. Ino, alipigwa. Ile kupigwa. The other prisoners cared for him as best as they could without accesses to running water or good facilities. So he was down there. They were working the whole day and then in the evening they would find him in, in his filth, in pain and alone, and they would feed him and help him. So we pick the story from there. He was beaten, left in his filth, the other prisoners used to help him, and so on. So many years after they have been released, one day, someone knocked at Dimitri's door. It was the communist who had crippled him. He said this, Sir, don't believe that I have come to ask forgiveness from you. Don't. For what I have done, there is no forgiveness, not on earth or in heaven. You are not the only one I have tortured like this. You cannot forgive me. Nobody can forgive me. Not even God. My crime is much too great. But I have come only to tell you that I'm sorry about what I have done. And from you and from here, I go to hang myself. That's all. And then he turned to leave. The paralyzed brother Dimitri said to him, Sir, in all these years, I have not been so sorry as I am now that I cannot move my arms, I would like to stretch them out to you and to embrace you. For years, I have prayed for you every day. I love you with all my heart. You are forgiven. At that point, our faith will be tested. We must then ask the question, how much do we want to be like Jesus? Dimitri, this is the man who killed you. Oh, Martin Luther, King Senior, these are the people who killed your wife and your firstborn son. But he loves them. He says, I cannot hate them. How about if God would say this? Just like you trash them, I'm going to trash you. Just like you mistreat them, I'm going to mistreat you. What would you say? But the Lord is saying, you can forgive because I have forgiven you. And that will help you to come out from resentment. Shall we pray? Father, some of us desperately need this message right now. But some of us, we are going to need it soon because we live in a broken world. 
Deliver us from anger. Baptize our lips. Cleanse us from resentment. Free us from malice. May the river of grace wash away every trace of bitterness. Lord Jesus, make us agents of forgiveness and missionaries of your grace. Where there is hatred, let us show love in Jesus' name. And everybody say, Amen. The Lord bless you.